emphasizing the themes of scale and, and, and innovation, which are uh, repeating themes in today's conversation, as well as uh, words like practical and uptime, which I expect will evolve from uh, today's uh, uh, all-star plenary panel, um, which as Mary said, is, is often a, a feature of GCDCS uh, conferences. We have a tremendous panel for this year's session. You've, you've already met two of the panelists and if it's possible to bring everybody up on screen, that'd be great. Uh, our morning keynote, Eugene Roman rejoins us as does uh, Andrew Epic. Managing Director for Equinix. Let me introduce the other members on the panel. I'm gonna start with the one who's actually here next to me in the room. Um, Paul Cooper is current president of the Technology Integration Group in Canada, former head of Dell Canada, which I, were you there or at GE Capital when I met you? I think it was GE Cap. So it's been a long time and neither one of us is gonna admit how long, but in his current role, Paul helps Canada's public sector to evolve to consumption-based approaches to technology. So. Thank you, Paul. Joining us online um, uh, from Texas is Cheryl Rodenfels, field CTO for Stratascale. Good morning. Before, uh, before joining Stratascale, Cheryl was CTO America's Healthcare for Nutanix. She's been SVP CIO and AVP Enterprise Architecture for large US-based healthcare institutions and has been a senior IT executive in the financial services industry as well. Um, oh, I have a monitor. How great is that? Zooming in from California is data center legend Peter Gross. Peter founded uh, data center design pioneer EYP Mission Critical, which subsequently became HP's data center design business unit. Most recently, he has held senior executive and board positions with firms that are committed to bringing enhanced sustainability <clears throat> as a foreshadowing of Peter's second appearance today on the uh, sustainability panel that Mary will moderate this afternoon um, through alternative power solutions to the data center industry. And through all of this, he has been a member of the All-Star Plenary Panel each year we've had it at GCDCS. Um, also on screen, much closer to home, we have quantum guru, Michele Mosca, president of Evolution Q, founder of the Perimeter Institute. And coming to us from a secret location near Toronto is Rocco Alonzi, who's carved out a unique role spanning data center operations and governance currently as AVP at Manulife and previously with other financial services institutions, including BMO folks. Thank you so much for joining us. It's terrific to have you. So listen, the strength of this panel is the deep and diverse perspectives of its expert members. So rather than going through a set of structured questions, we're just gonna raise a handful of topics and ask our panelists to share their opinions and positions on them. So. Now, let me start with the theme of today's event, digital innovation and the next normal. If you were walking through the physical or, or the virtual doors in this event and you saw that title in the banner, what would you expect to hear discussed in the session? What kinds of insights would you be listening for? You know, I'd, I'd like to say that while working with our customers, one of the things that people would be looking for is, We've had all this activity, whether tactical or temporary with all of our COVID accommodations, where did we leave off and how can I move faster uh, with some of the things I had to leave behind when we scrambled to do uh, work from home, work remote, work hybrid, um, change our digital front door because people were accessing us remotely. So I'd like to, you know, I, I think people would be interested in, okay, how do I get back on track or how do I go faster? And I think that's, that, that's a really interesting topic because it's not only uh, how do we catch up to the technology initiatives that got left behind there, but also uh, a question of um, process and people who may have gotten left behind in a wholesale shift um, to online education or to online retail or whatever you have it who, who didn't make that transition. I think that's, that's a great point. If I can add, uh, I think Cheryl's right. It's all about speed. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, Fast Company was a popular magazine. We don't talk about it much anymore, but Cisco built their whole enterprise on, on being fast. Let me give you a quick example. Joe Biden announced today that anybody entering the U.S. by plane has to have a PCR test um, 48 hours before they arrive. I'm heading to Philadelphia on Sunday. 
in the span of 10 minutes, I booked my PCR test Saturday morning. It's 10, 10 at the, near the airport. I'm paying extra. They're making money on it, but I have trip assurance that happened all digitally. You know, imagine, imagine doing that 10 years ago, uh, digitally. I also, I just got my confirm on email. It, it's, it's speed and speed for convenience. Uh, whether it's Uber, Uber Eats, uh, DoorDash, uh, Amazon, it's speed for convenience, and it's all it's all cloud enabled. None of this happens on my laptop. My laptop actually needs the cloud more than more than I need my laptop. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Michaeli. How about from a, a quantum perspective? Yeah. Well, it's not quantum per se, but I think two things. Well, one's already been touched upon is more people at the center of things, keeping that in mind, how this impacts people. Um, and also a more like a resilience mindset. Um, if it weren't for uh, our digital infrastructure, like so I think we we're, you know, previously we we're discussing this pandemic had happened 10 years ago, it would have been far worse. We're just lucky that we're able to pivot. It's, I mean, it, it's, it was, we we're lucky. Um, well, maybe it wasn't all luck, but we were, were um, beneficiaries of the fact that we could rapidly adapt and, and depend on digital platforms more than we'd ever imagined and, and innovate very rapidly. And things, I mean, yeah, there were some bugs, but things work. Imagine if that digital infrastructure collapsed. And we know many, many ways that could happen. So mm -hmm. we, we know this infrastructure, we're, we're on a thin, we're hanging by a thin thread basically right now. And let's not get complacent. I think we do need to build more resilience into these uh, absolutely critical uh, systems. You know, what I would hope to hear about is how are companies, how are organizations dealing with change? Yep. It's come at us faster, quicker, more forcefully than, than it has in 30 plus years of my working life. Uh, and we've all had to deal with it. And I'd love to learn from everybody how they've dealt with it, how they've led through it, and how they've gotten to the other side or close to the other side of this pandemic. Thanks. And just for everybody uh, in the room and online, our closing keynote is actually on exactly that topic, leading uh, in these times of change, delivered by, uh, by Alex Binet, former CIO of the Government of Canada, so I'd, who gave, by the way, last year the best keynote I've ever heard. So I would definitely encourage you to stick around for that. Um, Andrew, uh, Peter, I'm going to give you the last word, as I always do. But Andrew, <laughs> um, what what do you expect to hear or expect to talk about or expect to think about uh, with respect to digital innovation in the next normal? Uh, I guess optimism to put it in a word because there, there's been so much learning that has gone into the last 40 years to get us to this point. So uh, when I see four times, at least the investment and the progress uh, in the last 18 months, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that the ideas are there and now this forcing factor of, of, of the PC world, the post-COVID world, it's really helped organizations ruthlessly prioritize what's important. Um, RFPs and RFIs and future views of, of, of perspectives that are well understood get abandoned for what do we need to do tomorrow in order to make sure our business not only thrives, but survives. So it's this optimism and this kind of when you're put in a hard spot, Good things can sometimes bubble to the surface. So that, that's what I'm always hopeful for uh, as, as I join these yeah. discussions, Michael. Thanks. And Peter? Uh, yeah, the, the issues that I, I think are of interest to uh, everybody, um, you know, I obviously don't have answers to most of them, other than the obvious one, uh, AI and, uh, uh, and uh, meta space, uh, blockchain and quantum. I, I, we're going to have some discussion about quantum computing here, but but also um, um, how is this uh, digital era era changes the relationship between companies, uh, customers, employees? Uh, also, how uh, this uh, technology uh, technology convergence bringing together humans and technology? This is very you know in interesting to me. Uh, Another thing uh, is how the digital world will help alleviate the environmental crisis. Uh, how, how is the, the world going to uh, be able to uh, address the big issues uh, uh, that are facing uh, mankind today? Um, 
and that that that's the <laughs> the uh, the pandemic is one one of those uh, uh, features. <clears throat> Thanks very much. And actually, that's a, that's a great lead into the next question. Um, we, we like to say that the All-Star Plenary helps set the agenda, not just for GCDCS, but, but for the year to come. And that's especially true this year um, when Mary has challenged all of our on-site and remote delegates to think about how the ideas they hear and the things they learn today will affect the actions they take as we move into and, and through 2022. So with that in mind, you know, what's the, what is the killer app or the killer environment or the killer capability or the most critical topic, like the ones that Peter just uh, listed off, that will shape data center and IT service delivery strategies in, in 2022 and, and the several years beyond? I can kick that off, Michael. I, I think uh, for me, um, cloud continues to be uh, kind of a, a key topic and, and something that we should all be focused on. And it's, it's not cloud as we know it to this point, but really how cloud is evolving, right? If you think about cloud uh, as it currently exists, we've got kind of the hyperscalers, we've got now sovereign cloud providers in country dealing with, with data sovereignty issues and other things that have come up as a result of the adoption of of cloud and the movement of workloads to the cloud, regional players, private clouds. And now we're hearing increasingly about IT consumption models that kind of extend cloud economics into uh, on-premise kind of data center. And so I think the reason that's important is because it's really giving uh, people options, companies and organizations in the public sector option with respect to how they, uh, where they place their workload where is the most appropriate place for that workload to be running relative to the services or the application that's being provided? And it comes back to something that Eugene said earlier. It allows, I think, all of us to build agility and speed into everything that we do, right? If you look at the way kind of that continuum of cloud offerings works, uh, you can pick kind of the right cloud for your circumstance and really optimize your ability to scale and move quickly. So I, I think that's the killer app still. Uh, if you will, for this year and, and maybe for a couple of years to come. Thanks. Anybody I, else agree, yeah, disagree, have a different idea? No, I'd like to jump on that and say, you know, it's customer experience and application performance. So if the customer experience is great because they are doing everything remotely or we're driving them to the remote channels, um, sometimes the technology that customer doesn't really care whether it's cloud or on-prem or off-prem but we as organizations that, that provide the services, we have to make sure that that application performance is top notch. Otherwise the customers will go someplace else to uh, services that are. So uh, making sure that we're optimized and, and then again, driving exactly what you said, driving that cost so that it's, we're operating effectively. But I think customer experience is one of the biggest drivers um, and we're all aware of driving that digital front door even harder. And when you look at how customers react to that, I mean, what, what have you seen to be effective or important in driving improved customer experience or, and or improved application performance? Well, I, you know, I think if you look at your smartphones, you turn them on and they just work. The applications you download, everything is relatively integrated. Um, and a lot of our portals and websites and uh, digital front doors haven't been that way because we don't interoperate the uh, applications or the data very well, or um, it, you know, we, we haven't architected them well, or it, again, we've, we've got some legacy technology that we're trying to make, you put, uh, lipstick and a dress on. And in a lot of cases, what really need to do is if we're going to move to modern technologies, you have to re-architect and, and people, um, we just haven't done a lot of that. Thanks. Um, yeah, if I may, have a couple of other things that um, another few technologies that touch, um, will reshape the, this, uh, this industry. Uh, the most obvious is uh, AI, right? Uh, um, what they're saying is that uh, AI is going to going to eat the world. Uh, uh, this is the, the 
the old uh, saying that software is eating the world, but in reality, I think that technology is going to, this technology is going to have really profound and significant effects on the industry and society in the next decade. Uh, um, you know, AI is driving out of industry. Um, AI will likely uh, I don't know, design semiconductors and uh, uh, design uh, new, uh, uh, new drugs that uh, will, uh, uh, will save the world. Um, other technologies that, uh, um, you know, I discussed some of them here, uh, it's uh, 5G and uh, related to that is uh, edge computing. Um, you know, it's, uh, um, it, uh, it's fairly uh, widely agreed that uh, by uh, 2025, 2026, uh, almost 50% of all data collected and processed will be outside the enterprise cloud. Uh, it's gonna be at the edge. Um, other things are everything is a service, uh, just like you, uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, not only cloud, but uh, um, data center as a service, power and cooling as a service, which is interesting, even uh, DC management as a service. Um, software define everything, um, um, you know, the concept of uh, uh, software defined data center has existed, but it's now st starting to take shape or compute and storage um, network, even power. All these services are, um, are uh, pulled uh, and aggregated and managed uh, together by some sort of intelligent uh, policy-driven software that will provide automation and, uh, and also business management. And finally, things like uh, uh, quantum computing, nanotechnology, uh, blockchain, and even crypto. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eugene, I, I hate to get you to actually do a little bit of work work as part of a, a volunteer panel or anything, but you are um, AI exec in residence at the Schulich School. And uh, you know, Peter mentioned AI. And I've got a real question about that. Like, how does AI spread? I mean, the, the examples that Peter used, uh, semiconductor design, uh, pharmaceutical design, are good examples of where building a center of competence around AI is a, a reasonable step into AI. And yet, most of the way that we see it in the real world is AI infused into uh, individual products that are uh, introduced discreetly into different corporate environments. I mean, do you have some guidance on how we should expect to see AI roll out within uh, within corporate environments? Yeah, I think I think you know it's the it's the billion dollar question uh, that metaverse or what I call a digiverse. Uh, I go back to McLuhan. Uh, what AI does is it creates new connections. And those new connections are what uh, are come to the table. So we look at the world we're in, what we described this morning as the, the emerging post-COVID world. Supply chain logistics is going to be number one from a couple of reasons. Availability. Um, my family's in the wine business. We were chatting in the in the room before it started. I wish I owned a cardboard company. You can't ship very much without cardboard. In this, you know, who'd have thought in the digital world cardboard would matter that much? Um, but the supply chain use of use of logistics to minimize energy consumption, make product available. This is going to be a rough Christmas for some retailers who haven't worked out their logistics. Take a look at my, my previous company where I retired from Canadian Tire. They bought a port in British Columbia to guarantee that the ships had some place to land, priority landing. They actually invested in a port. So AI though will then tell you, okay, I've got X thousands of containers coming and going. Uh, it then adds algorithms to the mix and allows things to happen. There's no question that, you know, we, we have a disruption in climate. Uh, we don't have to go very far. We go to both ends of our country, uh, highly disrupted in both uh, the East and the West. Well, AI will help us to understand how to deal with that better. But that, it, may not solve, it won't solve the problem, but help us deal with it better. Just look at what AI has done for, for COVID uh, vaccine research. You know, the protein folding was a, a, um, an AI manifestation 
Um, and now people are complaining, well, we don't know about this new variant, Omicron. Uh, it's going to take two weeks to figure out what it does. Well, go back 10 years ago, it would take two years. And uh, sorry, I have to stand up because I've been sitting and I have a cramp that comes from sitting too much. But so, so 10 years, two weeks, and people complain, oh my gosh, it takes two weeks. Yeah, well, two weeks to use a lot of AI to try and figure out the cause and effect of a new variant. And uh, I kind of believe in the closing comment that AI will save humanity. Uh, just, like, just like the locomotive changed the world, AI is gonna change the world, there's no question. But the key is, is how you put deep thought into it. And you know, one of the areas is, is do some homework. Uh, I, I look for things like the human cloud, the human factor is going to be more and more important. And uh, this, is, this is the key thing. Uh, so you know, it's up here, it's gray hair and not gray hairs that are going to come together around this. And this conference is an ideal way to share thinking, jar loose thinking, but also to, to discover uh, things we already know but haven't quite thought about. And that's really the key. Hey, Eugene, pick up on the, perhaps the less gray hair category because uh, so much to learn from the foundation. But when, when we go back to Michael's question about the killer app, um, I, I cut my teeth 25 years ago in the, in the wireless space. And as a marketer, you were called upon to figure out how to price a text message or what was that killer app that was going to drive more traffic. And we didn't have a clue because until that point, um, it was looking back at information in order to understand what trends were and how to price things out. Um, looking forward, it's this readiness principle. Eugene used the, the, the pronoun they a whole lot. It is not any one company that's going to come up with the killer app. It's going to be these collaboration of ecosystems where some AI and some location service and some payment processing is going to culminate around a user requirement that is yet to be determined. Um, it, I, 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 I don't have a clue how fast Uber had to grow or Airbnb, and I sure as heck don't understand my kids' affinity to TikTok. But at the end of the day, those were all driven out of end user and consumer kind of momentum that then brought industries towards them. And the only industries that 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 truly have the crystal ball is is the ones that know that it's gonna be some future proofing that they get ready for, that's the killer app. It's the, it's the killer mindset. It's the, it's the collaboration in an ecosystem mindset. It's the readiness for whatever ecosystem you're gonna join in order to put these parts together quickly. Because th this is a team sport. This is, this is a not, uh, we see where the puck's going to use the, the, the cliche Canadian analogy. It's, it's being ready to see where, where things uh, uh, our position and, and how to collaborate to get there. It's funny you should say that, Andrew, because as I was looking at the three panelists who had yet to address this topic, as you know, Eugene was talking, I thought, well, Andrew and Michaeli and Rocco are coming from completely different perspectives, but all converge on the AI and the capability of enabling it that, uh, that uh, yeah, that you've eloquently said it requires that kind of group effort. Michaela, do you want to do you want to weigh in on where you see the killer opportunities being? Well, I'm going to talk about it a bit next as well. But I mean, my familiarity is, is, is in the cybersecurity in the quantum space. And I think the data center community uh, needs to figure out pretty rapidly. And it'll be an evolving understanding because we don't have all the answers now because for, for one how can the the current power of data centers enable quantum quantum computing quantum communication right you may be a great resource for all this this uh, revolution as some people call it right and the other flip side is quantum computers are going to need to be stored and maintained somewhere and, and be accessed right quantum communication networks the route the, the quantum routers they need to sit somewhere where right is that a place for data centers? Should they all be in data centers? Should some of them, none of them? You know, um, and these are standard business questions. If you don't do it and someone else does, can they come and then disrupt you and take over what you're doing? And 
I don't know. Um, so there's a, a lot of, a lot of, I mean, I'll elaborate a bit more in, in the next part. Um, <laughs> this could Peter, be, uh, Peter, you're one of the world's leading authorities on, on how data centers get designed and, and, and evolve. I mean, how would you answer the, the question from Michele? How, how do these things get hosted and connected? Actually, uh, I did spend a bit of time trying to understand how the, the data center uh, uh, will evolve uh, in the end of uh, in the, uh, time of quantum computing. And uh, what's interesting is uh, uh, there's a fairly wide consensus that the quantum computing we're gonna use a lot less energy than, than conventional computers, a lot less. Uh, but what's interesting, the total amount of power that the data centers are, are housing the, the quantum computers will probably stay the same or even be, be uh, even higher than that. I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing because as you probably might know that uh, the, the quantum computing using a, uh, this uh, um, uh, Namibium uh, metal loop that uh, um, acts as a, uh, as a uh, superconductor, because it uh, is, has to be chilled at uh, about uh, 15 uh, millikelvins, uh, which is close to minus 273 degrees C. Uh, so the amount of power required to keep these computers uh, at that temperature is gonna be quite significant. And the, the reliability of the power going to be, has to be at least as high as it's today. So <laughs> we're shifting, uh, we're shifting uh, uh, the data center design from, from uh, uh, powering computer now to powering the environment. Uh, uh, computer. So it's going to be PUE, an interesting shift. PUEs will become like 72 or something. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, I agree with really like McKinley's brain though, and perhaps offline, but the ability to have a distributed environment that then was able to spin up the required workloads because i mean the the napster com uh, uh concept the blockchain concept the alternative is where are these pockets of uh, of capacity that then can be consolidated in an efficient way or pushed out where those calculations and requirements are most useful um i think is another kind of vector to to, to contemplate but uh Michele, uh, again just uh truly really impressed with kind of the thought that goes into it. Cause when I start to hear Eugene stats around kind of billions uh, within seconds, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty spoiled user group out there and they're hungry for data that is increasing exponentially. Well, you know, let me, uh, and Rocco, I'm sorry, I will come back to you, but, but I, I do want to capitalize on where we're going here. Cause we have a quantum guru in the house. Doesn't happen every day in my house. Um, uh, and I don't want to turn this into a quantum session, although we had a fascinating one at GCDCS last year. Um, Michaeli, when we spoke in the lead up to the event, you talked about quantum threat versus happy quantum or quantum opportunity. Can you elaborate on how quantum is creating or, or will create threats and opportunities that impact private and public sector organizations? Yeah, well, it's probably worth just backing up and, and quantum isn't a technology, right? It's a physical paradigm. So it's more like electromagnetism. And we, we started to understand electromagnetism really a hundred plus years ago. And that led to all sorts of technologies that most, you know, most, most of the economy uh, relies on now, wireless communication, many wired communications and computing and so on and so on. And so quantum is actually one layer below electromagnetism. It's a, it's a framework for physical theories. And the implications, it's like, you know, electromagnetism, you harness it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, internet years later, and you have everything we have today. So we can't possibly predict all the impacts of, of harnessing quantum physics, but we do know a lot, right? And we know how it impacts, at least we, have, we know a lot about how it impacts computing, right? We know how it impacts uh, sensing, right? We know how it impacts cybersecurity, but, but I'm sure there's more we haven't understood yet. And we need to, but another important feature of quantum, it's so deep down, like it, it is really like the, it's a, it's not an incremental enhancement. It's not like, oh, another way to, to, to build a conductor or something. It really can make impossible things possible. Exponential power that we didn't know was there. So the, the, and where it applies is unpredictable. 
And you could say, well, that's always the case, but no, it's more unpredictable and the impact could be a lot higher. <clears throat> so readiness is really critical uh, to really continue to thrive in this era. <clears throat> so there's the happy quantum. People want to know how, can you use quantum to speed up ML, which can then speed up all sorts of things? <clears throat> well, maybe, right? <laughs> and you don't want to get caught off guard uh, with that. So it's that, that's one of many tracks we're following on the quantum computing side. The one, and just why do I, why am I so confident that it could have this massive disruptive impact, like positive disruptions, right? If you capture it properly. Well, because, uh, you know, if you asked me in 1993 and I worked in this space, can you use quantum to break public key cryptography? No, not that we know of. He asked me in 1994 and it's like, yeah, you can. And it didn't go, well, you can, you're a little bit faster. It's like it went from, it's completely unbreakable to completely decimated. Going to bigger keys won't help. Like usually cryptographic breaks are not that harsh, right? Most of the breaks are like, oh crap, we have to go to, we have to double our keys or something. <clears throat> Complete decimation. So that, that was an eye opener. And it was a blessing in disguise that we didn't first build quantum computers to design new materials and so on, and then find out well, again, in the 90s, first of all, we didn't have the computers and who really, who would have died if public key cryptography was broken in the 90s? I don't know. I'm sure they're indirectly, some people would have, but it wouldn't have been the catastrophe that it is today, where almost all of our critical infrastructures directly or indirectly rely on the cryptography that quantum would break. And imagine 10 years from now, where we have IoT and OT, everything's going to be connected, implanted medical, driverless cars, you know, all powered by 5G and AI and so on, like the vulnerability is even worse. And if we hadn't known back then that quantum would actually break all of this, we would have been caught completely off guard with no time whatsoever to react. And it, it really is not clear that it would have been a recoverable error. So that this is sort of the threat side. There's other potential threats maybe, I, you know, but this is orders of magnitude more than any of the speculative threats we know of. We've known about it since 94, right? And I really think it is a blessing because take the quantum threat off the table. Very serious people, Tahir al Gamal, the inventor of SSL, right, are saying the status quo is not acceptable right now, including myself. It's not acceptable because if quantum doesn't break, this other, just a smart mathematical advance could break the foundations of our digital platforms, the security, the crypto, the cryptography. Crypto now has become cryptocurrency, so I'm trying not to, but anyway, cryptography, right? That's an unacceptable risk that we're just taking because of inertia. But if you really did the analysis and you really went to your board of directors and said, look, this is the risk we're taking because we're using crypto without a failover plan, I, I really personally don't think it, it'd be that uh, well received if it was truly articulated properly <clears throat> but we part one of the reasons we don't is because what are you supposed to it's just too much of a challenge to change it but quantum is saying look this is not a hypothetical thing anymore here's a well-defined way that this could actually happen so it's forcing us <clears throat> to rebuild a more agile more resilient foundation to cybersecurity. and if we do it properly we can emerge from this stronger and more resilient than we otherwise would have been. If we react, we're going to emerge from it much worse off than we already are, which is already unacceptably fragile, I would say. So why is this an opportunity? I already, it's a blessing in disguise. We can build more, more resilient foundations. And honestly, Canada can be at the global epicenter of this massive migration of our digital platforms. So there's also an economic opportunity in, 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 in being the rebuilders of these tech, of these uh, foundations. That's, that's great. And you know what, in, in the context of a conference like this, you can kind of see quantum as, as, as the extension of a, a, a succession of technologies that have made, you know, that some of which Eugene sketched earlier that have, have made, technology faster and more capable over time, you know, more rapid CPUs, GPUs, massively parallel computing all the way out to, to now a, 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 a quantum leap literally in, in power and, and capacity. I'd like to ask the other panelists, if they can comment a little bit on um, how massively faster compute 
as far as quantum or, or stopping with more conventional technologies might impact their um, the industries they're familiar with. Rocco, are you still online? Yes, I'm here, and I've been I've been feverishly taking quotes and uh, and notes. So 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 let me let me let me kind of regurgitate what I'm hearing from these other panelists, which, by the way, is a lot of great points being made. So, so the businesses are transforming based on applications of new digital technologies. These technologies are becoming very essential uh, for these companies as we innovate. And they include, and I've been hearing, social media, uh, cloud computing, data analytics, mobile phones. And we touch a little bit upon really wanting to move fast for our customers, right? The end client. But yet there's, there's, a, there's always this thing around the benefits and the challenges, especially when you're talking about regulatory compliance, digital disruption, right? And we're seeing more companies, well, companies like, like social media groups are working maybe a little more closely with businesses, but I don't know if they share the same values and that's going to make it tough for some of these groups as we move forward. Right. Um, so, so we'll need to keep grappling with that, right? As as some of these things come up, uh, especially in the in the financial, in the financial yes. sector, because of, of of the regulatories and and the compliance and what they need to maintain. So, I, I I don't know how we get past that. I keep hearing quantum and I keep hearing how we change stuff. It, but everyone has kind of made a point back to we're 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 making decisions. We're moving quickly but there's always going to be that sort of emergency break or something that's still snagged on the road that keeps us from really moving quickly. Any comments on that? Yeah, Paul, I mean, you work with a regulated industry and, you know, building on what Rocco just said and building on what Michaeli said and this notion of much, much more rapid computing and what Eugene said earlier about much, much more connected uh, computing and user groups. I mean, Regulatory disruption, particularly with work patterns. How, how do you see that playing out as we as we move forward in public sector? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I would say to start, um, you know, I have uh, faith and optimism in, in what is to come. Uh, quantum computing is, is a topic I don't fully understand. I'm not educated in in that regard. It's been interesting to learn more through this panel discussion about it. Uh, but it, it certainly is going to bring about some possibilities that don't exist today, good and bad, right, as we move forward. It brings to mind an experience of mine personally when I got into the computer industry in the late 80s and I learned about Moore's Law. And, you know, I was selling computers at the time and they were a certain capacity and capability and they cost a huge amount of money for what you were getting. And somebody explained Moore's Law to me and how quickly things would change and that, that the chip chip density would double every couple of years, and this would go on forever. Um, and you start to, to then fast forward and think about the capacity and the compute that's going to be available over time. And it just seemed ludicrous, I'll be honest, at the time. I just thought that can't possibly ever be even necessary. But here we are 30 years later, and I can say that's not true. Right? <laughs> the, the reality is we find a way as, as humanity to take advantage of that. Right. As, as things have progressed, you know, we went from kind of dial up to the Internet to, uh, you know, video conferencing to, uh, you know, uh, video now into virtual reality. Right. And all of that is powered by the computers that, you know, I thought would never be kind of used in, in that capacity. So I have great optimism, Michael, about, you know, kind of what the next 30 years will bring, including quantum computing. Because as that occurs, I think the possibilities are just staggering as to what, you know, somebody will be sitting up here maybe in 30 years, probably won't be me, but somebody will be sitting up here in 30 years talking about this and, and they'll be able to walk through that kind of roadmap of what's occurred and, and what really enabled it. So, you know, bringing that back to the public sector, my concern with public sector entities and, and regulated institutions and organizations is that they often are inhibited in ways that uh, commercial organizations are not from taking advantage of these developments of these opportunities. There are always things around procurement and value for money and their budgetary process that, that puts them in a position where they can't adopt or adapt to these new technologies as, as others do. 
And so if this is going to accelerate, you know, that's something that has to be um, reconciled now, right? We, we have to figure this out collectively uh, in Canada and perhaps even around the world so that these organizations can move just as quickly as kind of these digital native companies that we all know have capitalized on the compute and the technologies that are available. So optimistic, um, concerned a little bit about, you know, the, in, in the hands of the wrong actors, this technology uh, could be devastating. And I think it's good to hear that real industry experts are focused first on that cybersecurity aspect, right? In terms of what is this gonna mean when it occurs? But I'm optimistic about what the future brings for all of us in terms of what will be possible. When we get Thank you, that's great. Um, Cheryl, I mean, you've got both a financial and a, a healthcare background and in both contexts have faced many of the same constraints that Paul talked about. And, uh, hopefully share a little bit of his optimism as well. Um, what do you see as the impact of the massive increase in, in technology power that, that we heard uh, described uh, by Michaeli, um <clears throat> in both conventional and, and quantum terms in, in a healthcare context? What does that do to how healthcare is, is done and delivered? Well, I think one of the things we see in healthcare is that there are two basic entities you have the academic medical centers and this is where your scientists and your your folks that actually can understand and and adopt quantum are these are the folks that are going after genomics data they're going after um, the covid impact data they're going after after all kinds of scientific research and they're going after things that that your traditional healthcare providers aren't doing there and, and the bridge between them is are the results that come out of what the scientists are working through and and some of the results on the provider side uh really hospitals are trying to make leaps but but you know as was mentioned uh some of it is financial because especially in the u.s everything is you know non-for-profit healthcare. we do have for-profit health care too those guys tend to have a little bit more money but look at what we just did over the last two years we rolled out telehealth a little more broadly that was number five on most of their lists numbers one two and three were how do i replace my ehr how do i get my erp system working better so that it's not on these clunky old things that are 30 years old with legacy technology so there's there's a bridge between them but the i i think um in traditional provider uh, situation, you have admins and some engineers, but again, the academic medical centers have the scientists, they have the researchers, they have that. And I think uh, seeing the results of how these two come together is where we'll see the benefit. And um, I, I, I think the cost in the academic setting is a little more acceptable because that's what they do. So, uh, a lot of healthcare providers have started innovation groups and so forth. And you know what? They figured out a better way to help you log on so you only you don't have to reset your password all the time, or they give you a QR code or something convenient to help you with your uh, patient getting to the the hospital and getting your your personal data back or tracking your medicines. But they're not thinking of those big things. It, it's just split in in how they approach it. So it sounds like that the academic medical centers would be ripe to take advantage of continuously escalating technology capabilities. And that there's a bridge between them and traditional providers that are saddled by tech debt and where uh, innovation is basically user experience innovation or, or cleaning up some technical debt. So. I mean, does the increased availability of more powerful technology stretch that bridge? Does it, does it help the, the, the laggards catch up a little bit or does it just accelerate the leaders to where the laggards no longer understand what's being said? I think it's a little of both, but you, you, it also depends on the culture of the organization. If they take their funding that they do have and apply it to some of these technologies that maybe they can uh, take advantage of a technology that is far superior and skip the three projects in between. So not only are they catching up, they're going ahead. 
but we don't see a lot of that because it's traditional life cycle management. I want the next version. I want the next size monitor. I want the next size CPU. I want the next size. And, and it's just uh, not traditional how they've thought I can move ahead if I adopt these technologies. They also are risk averse. I don't want to be the first on my block to have this. Um, let's see somebody else use it and, and take advantage of it because if it works, great. Well, I'll buy it. And, and if it doesn't, um, I don't want to be the guy that ends up in the newspaper because, you know, it didn't work. Um, Eugene, you've, you've lived in retail where laggards are common, but you've been a force of driving innovation and that kind of leapfrogging that Cheryl said is so difficult to get infused into uh, uh, healthcare culture. I mean, how do you see the impact of hugely escalated uh, processing capacity and connectivity, changing the way that retailers move and, and affecting perhaps the, the balance of power between those that do manage to seize onto these leapfrog opportunities versus those that maybe are, don't want to be the first kid in the block or even the second to adopt? Well, I think um, that there's a piece of work that um, I discovered, and we're all discovering things all the time, but in 2014, I discovered a piece of work called Ambient Findability by Peter Morville. Um, I, I just got an extra copy because I, I inadvertently gave away my last copy and just arrived to Amazon, up through Amazon. But ambient findability in retail it meet, goes in the following way. If you find what you want, you have an 88 times out of 10 chance of buying it. If you don't find what you want, it drops to zero. It's an all or nothing proposition. So at, at Canadian Tire, we coined the term Marvel's Law. Finding what you want. Now, then you say, well, what about suggesting? Well, that opens the door. Once you find what you want, uh, you, you get these synapses in your brain saying, I'm satisfied. Uh, so and it's a simple test. Google best gourmet pizza if you're in Toronto, Toronto or Hamilton. Somebody's biasing the answer. But ambient findability in retail is the force. Is it search? Yeah. But more than just search, it's finding what you want. Today's, for example, my shopping uh, desire today is my wife wants the canvas Canadian Tire Beaver to decorate the outside of our house. Christmas is coming. I have had a hell of a time. I, I know there's a store in Mississauga has one that's 100 kilometers away. I just want to click and, and have it delivered to me. Okay. You get my point. I found it. But it's a long distance away from me today. And I'm actually doing a plan how to get to that store before they sell it. Because these things are in short supply. So ambient findability is something we don't talk a lot about. Add in um, what uh, Michelle would say is the quantum effect. If you could find everything you wanted at the, at, with one click, now easy to say, wouldn't that be something? That's what our, our young people, that's what our, our, our smartphone enabled folks, that's what they expect today. And that's that on-demand world that, you know, us gray hairs dreamed of. And uh, I was punished for thinking about, you know, everyone's going to be on demand. What are you talking about? You're going to go to a store. You're going to do this. You're going to, all of that has disappeared. Yes, you will go to a store if you choose to, but ambient findability, more Peter Morville, who by the way, is a data architect. Now I was gonna go meet him last year and COVID got in a way, he lives in Ann Arbor, but the guy's a genius. Ambiently find what you want, uh, that's retail. And uh, the we coined the term air, ambient intelligence for retail. And to think of ambient intelligence, hmm. And you say, is Christmas coming on December 25th, by the way? What day of the week it is? I don't know and I don't care, but Christmas is coming December 25th. There's a whole phenomenon there, right? New Year's, you know, December 31st. Easter this year, I don't know. I don't shop a lot for Easter. It's Christmas and New Year's, but you get the point. That's ambient. It's always on my mind. Now you go to the store and it's musicology is there, jingle bells, you know, uh, Frosty the Snowman. Uh, the web, by the way, doesn't use musicology. Go click on a website because where's my music? 
Where's my color? That's yet to come, by the way. AI will bring that to the table and say, Eugene really likes this type of music based on his last 10 selections. Let's play that for him. But that's ambient. Um, and ambience, the ambient state uh, really makes for ambient intelligence. And that's really what uh, retail is all about. And those that figure it out will win. Uh, I predict, prediction today, Macy's is back ambiently. They lost everything. <laughs> And at, but watch my prediction. I've been tracking it. And May sees us back, just like Best Buy came back from the grave. Ooh. And uh, those that understand ambience will make it happen. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, Andrew, uh, by some argument, ambient and ubiquitous have at least parallel courses through lives. Um, how, does, uh, how does the massive expansion of compute capability play out? in an organization that is looking to network the edge? Where does, where does that have the most impact? Yeah, my flippant answer is you got to get better at Tetris as to where to put the workloads because you don't have buildings powered to a certain extent. Um, but I think it comes back again to that principle. And again, maybe quantum physics has this figured out, but you can't make light travel any faster. So it doesn't matter how big the fiber optic is, light goes at the speed that it is meant to go. I think that leaves us with the location conundrum and the monetization at the edge. So from our perspective and what we've seen with the top enterprises that are not responding even, they're, 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 they're embellishing the lack of capacity of others by its readiness in multiple locations around the world. So I, I don't think the compute power accelerates as much as the architectural capacity to have that capacity and compute power where it is needed, when it is needed. Because I think we'll have all the compute power in the world, we'll have the fattest pipes to run it through, but location eventually will be the, the limiting factor. You, you need to be able to be in the same capacity on aisle five with that retail shopper that you do on some place around the other side of the world. And with these large global companies, that does not come back all to one place at head office. That has to push towards the edge and monetize it out by the source. So Peter, from a design point of view, um, I mean, we've heard Moore's law, we've kind of heard at least references to Metcalf's law and to, uh, to uh, the, the whole notion of the speed of light as a constraint, which has actually been a constant in this conference since 2017. Um, <laughs> how, how do you play that game at Tetris in your opinion to accommodate both unlimited demand for technology enabled services and escalating capacity for uh, technology power delivery? Well, uh, yeah, that's the hundred dollar question. Uh, and that, that's why uh, uh, um, the big, um, the, 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 the fastest growing sector of this industry is gonna be um, edge data centers. Uh, um, you know, the, the architecture today, just like um, Andrew mentioned, uh, we still have uh, <coughs> the ability to use, um, you know, uh, large data centers at um, strategic location around the country to, to handle these. Uh, once uh, 5G becomes ubiquitous, uh, uh, which will uh, make uh, uh, IoT ubiquitous, that will make uh, uh, the need for this uh, computing at the edge essential. Uh, it's it's uh, it's latency, but it's also cost. Uh, just uh, just transferring this enormous amount of data to back to the mothership is becoming prohibitively expensive. So, so it uh, the vast majority of the data is going to be pro processed uh, at the at the edge, uh, and it's going to be stored and uh, processed at the edge. Uh, now, what to uh, what is that a five G or six G six G statement, Peter? Well, let's let's solve the five G problem first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have a long way to uh, 5G, although there's a lot of work on, on, on 6G already. Uh, so, uh, but um, uh, the, uh, there is a lot of interesting work uh, in uh, designing and the architecture for uh, edge, uh, edge data centers. And uh, uh, you don't see a lot of them yet. Uh, uh, the, the, the demand is not there yet. Uh, uh, but uh, but many companies uh, are, are working on that, and uh, 
Nobody knows exactly how it's going to look. Uh, we, we can leverage the uh, the vast uh, population of uh, collocation. Uh, you can leverage uh, all the uh, um, the uh, see also central offices that uh, are kind of sitting idle today uh, uh, from uh, AT and T or Verizon or any other. Uh, you're going to have uh, all these uh, micro and mini data centers. Uh, uh, being physically located next to the towers. Uh, this is uh, this is one of the things that uh, Vapor IO is doing. Uh, in, in terms of uh, on the design, uh, one of the mistakes that uh, people uh, uh, make is that uh, they assume that uh, the edge data center is going to be a small version of the conventional data center, which is uh, which is totally wrong. Uh, I think that the data center, is, uh, the, the edge data center, is going to be fundamentally different. It's going to be uh, obviously, lights out. It's going to be uh, automated. It's going to follow probably some uh, uh, some uh, hybrid version of uh, uh, OCP or uh, Open Open Nineteen. Uh, it's going to be uh, you know think of uh, Open Nineteen, uh, the, the architecture of the of the rack that will enable probably the uh, the uh, UPS uh, uh, technician uh, driver to replace a, uh, a a server in a location like this. Uh, uh, the, the densities are going to be much higher, whether we're going to use, uh, uh, we're going to be, uh, we're going to go away from the 10, 12 kilowatts per count. It's going to be uh, much higher than that. Um, it's, uh, um, uh, the location is going to be in the middle of, uh, 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 most, most likely in the middle of the city. If you, uh, if you uh, think that um, uh, you, you're going to place this uh, edge data center in uh, areas where uh, land cost is lower, probably you need to be concerned about um, physical security. Uh, uh, so how do you build these uh, uh, data centers to, uh, uh, to, to protect uh, fairly expensive uh, gear inside? So there are a lot of things that, uh, that uh, uh, people are working today on, uh, on designing these uh, data centers. Thanks, and guessing from the way Mary was cringing when we talked about uh, how many of these things would be deployed in different places, I expect the energy implications of uh, this massive deployment will come up in this afternoon's session. Um, you know, in the run-up to this session, several of the folks on the panel moved past discussions of technology to focus on management issues like agility and flexibility, on process, internal or customer facing, <coughs> on digital people and the skills needed inside the IT department and increasingly the technology skills needed to be successful in, in business unit functions. Um, I'm gonna ask each of you to, to pick on one of these and talk about how management needs to change or processes need to evolve or, or about the skills that new job market entrants or existing professionals need to stay current. And, and Cheryl, I know that digital people is actually a phrase I stole from you in the, in the run up to this. So maybe you can get us kicked off on this discussion. Sure, one of the things we work on is digital transformation. And on the technology side, it's easy and people have chief digital officers and we wanna take everything we can and electronify it and so forth. And one of the challenges, I, I asked a group in Dallas uh, last week, um, you've, you've done all these things, you, you've, you've gotten yourself a chief digital officer, you've got this innovation group and so forth. How's the rest of the organization reacting to uh, this digitalness and are they ready for it? And one of the gentlemen from a very large provider said, no, it's, it's good, we're, we're all getting it. But uh, just an easy example is uh, using a, uh, let's say Microsoft as their uh, word processor and so forth, um, they've decided to go to G Suite. And this is nothing about the product, the technology, but it, when rolling things out like this, remember when we used to go to word processing training where you could go take a Lotus class or you could take a Microsoft class and, and you learned how to use Excel and, and all of these things. Well, that doesn't happen anymore because again, like iPhones or, or uh, Android phones, things work, you figure it out, you touch a couple of buttons and things go. Well, the challenge is people, this technology like Excel spreadsheets has been embedded into these business units and all of a sudden they get a new tool that they have no training on like G Suite or uh, some of the uh, other technologies. I'm not picking on G Suite at all, 
But all of a sudden you have the shared document and the person who's been running their department off this spreadsheet goes to touch something and all the data is gone or different or the whole thing's disappeared and they don't know how to react. So this whole culture of, hey, you've got digital technology, but you have to do this change management and, and have digital people too who understand how to adopt the things that you're introducing, whether it's a, a digital workflow where you eliminate uh, somebody's day-to-day -day task. That's, that's very threatening uh, to the culture of an organization of, oh, you don't need me to move this widget from here to here. Um, so I, I think that's one of the challenges is it can't always be about the technology. You got to bring the organization along with um, the benefits as opposed to it being, we're doing technology for technology's sake. Thanks. Um, Rocco, you're, you have a unique title spanning governance and operations. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges of blending those, uh, those areas together? Yeah. So I, I just want to, I just want to pee back on Cheryl's point for a minute. So digital transformation and we're bringing together now application development groups along with IT. And now we're introducing, we're not doing waterfall work. We're going into scrums and, and doing things a lot quick, a lot more quickly. Uh, what, what I, what my experience has, has shown me is that in some cases you have application with competing priorities and IT groups with competing priorities and, and it's hard for them to mesh in order, in order to get to market faster. So I'm with you. Right. And, and in other cases I've seen where you, you gave me the, the, or the, the Excel spreadsheet analogy, right. And they want to bring something else to the table to maybe move away from that, but it wasn't, it wasn't on anyone's radar. <laughs> Someone thought it was a good idea and all of a sudden it's introduced and you're, and you're totally right. There's no training. All right. So I just wanted to piggyback on that because that that's, that's real life, real drama right now. in, in some of these organizations as they talk about digital transformation and, and I guarantee, well, I, I hope I would guarantee that if we talked about the definition of digital transformation, I think every one of us would give us a, a little slightly different definition of what that really means and, and how do we get there. Uh, with regards with regards to transformation with the work that I'm doing with the operations and governance, it's and we talked about this the other day offline. Whether you're wholly owned data center or whether you've got a, a multi-tenant or a co-location where you're managing it or the company's managing it, there's always this notion of traditionally people that were managing data centers were facilities people. And or the people that were managing the data center were a server, a network, or a storage person. And there's a, you, there's, a, there's a good blend there where you can bring both those two groups together with a data center type operations group. And it's, um, it's been, it's, I, I've now implemented it in three different uh, worlds um, or three different industries. And basically it works well, but there is some teething. Um, so, so the teething becomes, this is mine. Um, I own it and it's truly, they don't own it. They have something in there that they own. So the server people like to see their servers, the facilities, people love their HVACs and their PDUs and, and everything else that goes with it. So it, there's always that blend there, but that we're starting to see more and more, even in the business unit. And I go back to what you were saying, Cheryl, the application group development people with regards to it, they have to come much closer together and they are they're starting to and they're starting to learn off each other um you don't have to be it uh, the application developers but and and we have to learn a little bit more about what what is it that they really want out there and it's 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 been unique and i think a much better situation with regards to this you know, while we've been home for the last year and a half two years right where those groups are coming together a lot more frequently because there was a lot more things, hey, we gotta bring this up or we gotta get the time to market on this. And it's it's been a pretty good ride that way. I just hope the momentum keeps going because everyone here, we can all agree, things are pivoting pretty quickly and we're gonna have to we're gonna have to move pretty quickly. Thanks. We are down to nine minutes, but I do wanna hear from the panelists who've not weighed in on this topic yet. Um, Andrew, maybe I'll start with you. I, like in brief, what management challenges do you experience as you find uh, organizations looking to capitalize on a, a mindset change to moving workloads from data centers where, as Rocco said, they own it, they touch it, they hug it, 
to a distributed around the world closer to the user rather than closer to the management. Yeah, and it'll sound about a word as far from technology as you can imagine, but it's trust. So in a management style, you've got to create these kind of safe guardrails, but then trust that the experts are going to solve for the issue at hand better than you even define the problem. Um, the second tenant from, from any perspective of interacting to, to kind of convey value, and we talk about this a lot, is, is the values defined by the person on the other side of the desk. So this idea of pushing value and explaining how it's going to be done and how you're going to work with it, it really takes that inverse view of realizing that somebody else on the other side of the table has already defined value and contemplated it, and it's more of a responsive um, than, than an active. And two things that leaders by nature don't really like <laughs> is, is kind of giving over the reins as well as letting somebody else define kind of priorities and objectives. Well, and that's funny because, Paul, you, you and I have talked in many different scenarios, training and other sessions about how what the technologist thinks is less important than what the executive thinks because the executive signs the check. And then Andrew just laid out a scenario where what the executive thinks is less important than what the customer thinks because the customer processes the credit card. So, I mean, how do you see in, in, the, in a public sector context challenges with either process, because we have limited time, either processes or people affecting the ability to capitalize on technology uh, uh, increases and in growth? Well, I, I think it doesn't matter. Public sector, corporate entity, education institutions, where, wherever to mobilize change you have to take time you have to plan for that and you have to make sure that you've got the team that is going to be tasked with affecting that change you know along for the ride and that that isn't a simple task you can't just come out and say something that we're going to do this because it's logical to me uh, that we do it or we need to do it because it's a, a competitive threat if we don't whatever the case may be you have to make sure that everybody is on that journey that needs to be on that journey. Some people aren't just going to accept that change, embrace that change. They have to be sold on that. You have to identify you know, who those people are. And so as we talk about all of this over the last hour and a half, you know, that this concept of change, leading change, I think is critically important. I had the good fortune way back in my career to learn uh, from at GE about the change acceleration process, which they apply any form of change within their organization to ensure the highest probability of success in making that change, whatever it is, whether it's technology related or otherwise, they have a formula, they have a methodology by which you can lead that change. I would encourage everybody to think about change in this We all need to be thinking about how do we get to the other side successfully together. Thanks. Uh, Michaela, you are an educator and you're in a, an industry where skills are, are still very limited. I mean, what needs to change in terms of preparation for the, uh, uh, for the workforce from the academic uh, institutions on through the, uh, the corporations that, that hire grads? Yeah, we need to get a lot better and it's an ecosystem problem. I'm not blaming universities, I'm not blaming industry. I don't, I don't actually know. I just there's a, Let's fix the problem. Um, so on the industry side, you know, my one colleague jokes like, you know, I can spell quantum without a K, and, you know, that's already a major achievement. So when these emerging, like you really need a better way with, on the industry side to understand what these, because you don't actually have to understand quantum physics. Can you, people say, is there one thing I could read or how can I, how can I understand this succinctly and quickly? And we don't have that kind of resource really available. I think we do need to get better at translating that knowledge to people. You don't, you can't completely rely on hiring PhDs or university grads in these topics. You should be able to understand the bottom line and start making wise decisions. Um, so how can we, and this, this is sort of, there's a, there's a whole professional education or reskilling of the existing workforce that we need to get better at, um, as well as what we're generally pretty good at, which is producing graduates I mean, obviously, hire our grads is one way to get that knowledge into your company. It's not, but we need more than that. And um, we need to really sit down and do a proper analysis and fine grain all the different categories. We're trying to do this with Quantum Safe, and it's hard. Like, um, just all the different, because there's at least five to 10 different categories of worker 
that have different needs in terms of understanding what cryptography is and how do we migrate to this new quantum era. And we're trying to identify who and what they need and how do we get it to them. And sometimes we feel like, I mean, I've been hearing people whine about the shortage of the, in the cybersecurity workforce for a decade now. Whenever I try to say, okay, let's do something about it, we never really get very far. Uh, I won't get into all the things that haven't worked, but uh, I haven't seen anything that's really moved the needle on that side. Thank you, Peter. Um, what would you advise focusing on management or people or process? Well, uh, one of my, uh, my uh, concerns about this industry is the lack of, uh, of uh, um, young people joining our business. Uh, it's, it's been a problem that uh, is becoming probably uh, uh, aggravated uh, in the last few years, and a lot of people talk about this. Uh, I'm involved with a couple of universities uh, trying to address this problem. It's uh, uh, the, Most of the people working in the data center space uh, are coming from other industries. They have a long and difficult uh, uh, learning process. Schools are not equipped or not interested or don't have the uh, the expertise to, to prepare this, there are a few exceptions. Uh, uh, data center now be, is becoming such a multidisciplinary uh, 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 technology that, that, will in, uh, that will require people to understand both, the, the both sides uh, of the coin, the technology and the facility, understand, uh, understand uh, uh, security, uh, cyber security, understand power, understand cooling, understand uh, 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 fire protection. Now, there, there are a, a lot of things, and uh, I think that, uh, that we are not equipped. Uh, you, you look at the explosion of uh, new uh, data centers around the world, and uh, we don't see the same uh, the same number of people joining the, the, this business. And I think it's going to be a, a real serious problem in years to come. Thank you very much. Eugene, we've got three minutes left, two and a half minutes left. But you're both an educator and uh, an experienced uh, industry exec. Uh, and had the first word for the morning. So why don't you have the last word for the morning as well? Um, I think uh, Peter called it right. Um, the work in, in this side of IT or this sector is not considered cool. And young people, you say, I'm going to be a mobile developer, and they get really excited. I'm, I'm going to go run the cloud computing center that revolutionizes uh, saving humanity from COVID. Oh, uh, yeah, that, that, that's hard work. So the back office that most of us have grown up in is the front office. And we need to be teaching our young people this. You cannot do this digital age work that we talked about all morning without that. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like running a hydro utility. People take it for granted until the lights go out. Then they go, oh, my God, can't do it. all these things. So we live in the computing infrastructure world. And I think we have an obligation as professionals to make that clear. In the last 20 years, every new CIO, CTO job I took on, the data center needed a rehabilitation. That's 20 straight years. Four major corporations, my most recent one. Because that, it's out of sight, it's out of mind. Why worry about it? You just click nonsense the back office is the front office without it you're dreaming in chroma color and i think that's the lesson learned that uh, those of us who have a gray hair or andrew he has a little hair up there uh, you know it, it just comes from experience and that back office is cool i said to kevin albert who runs the canadian tire back office this is your time <laughs> and, and, you know, that's a great way to go thank you so much to all of you this has been a, this has been a terrific panel Not